and welcome Dwayne and Brian. I'm just going to let Thank our you. slide uh, take over the screen as we move to your topic. We've got Brian and Dwayne joining us. Yeah, so um, I'm here. I'm the local site director for Research Park uh, for Riverbed. And so um, we, uh, if you don't know about Riverbed, what we uh, do a lot of networking, so networking performance and visibility. And what we're going to talk about today a little bit is that second part about visibility. Because if you think about all the things that Laura talked about in her opening remarks about data, um, you need to send that data over networks. And here we're going to talk about that, that intersection uh, between uh, the networking information as well as uh, that amount, the size or scale of, of that data. Um, if you are interested in learning more about Riverbed, I did want to go ahead and put a plug in for our global user conference, which is next Tuesday. Uh, just go to the riverbed.com site and then you can register there mm -hmm. as well to find out more about that. Great. So with that, I will go ahead and turn that over to Brian. I just wanted Thanks. to introduce a little bit that for those of you who are involved in the research park, please reach out to Dwayne Dixon to learn more about their Champagne site. They've been here since 2008. Riverbed is based in San Francisco and has more than 30,000 customers, as you heard, working on WAN optimization and a number of technologies you'll hear about today. Dwayne's group at the Research Park works on both software engineering and QA. So if you're interested, they have mostly full-time employees, but might be building an intern team soon. So I think uh, learn right. more from Dwayne if you're interested in joining Riverbed. With that, we're really thrilled that you invited Brian to tell us more about Riverbed technology. So welcome, Brian Alverson. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Actually, Laura, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Dwayne, Brian. And Dwayne, before you jump off here, um, what do we have to do to get one of those deep bracers in the Cambridge office? <laughs> uh, we can expense that, we'll right? We'll work it out. No worries. Okay. All right. How about now? Looks great. Thanks, All right. Brian. Great. All right. So thank you, Dwayne, for that nice introduction. Um, as he said, my name is Brian Elverson. I'm a, uh, a team lead in engineering for Riverbed Technology. And today I thought I'd get creative and because Riverbed is a networking company and it's a big data conference, I would talk about uh, big data in your network. Very, very creative. So just today, um, I'm gonna start with a little bit about myself. Um, then we're gonna talk a little bit about networking just for people who are not quite familiar with it. Um, some challenges and problems that we've encountered in trying to uh, ingest uh, network data at enterprise scale, and then some of our solutions to those, uh, to those challenges. And then we'll end up with some Q&A at the very end. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I am not a data scientist by training. Um, in fact, uh, big data wasn't really a thing when I first got my degree. Uh, the degree I did get was a master's in electrical engineering with an emphasis in signal processing. Um, but during my course of study, I actually got a little more interested in uh, computer chip design from taking some digital design and VLSI design classes. So you'll notice that um, when I started my career, I actually started with Digital Equipment Corporation, which I don't know if many people have actually heard of that. It was big back in the 90s. Um, with the uh, Alpha Development Group, but then digital got bought by Compaq. Our part of Compaq got bought by Intel. I left Intel to uh, work for AMD, but by 2007, I had kind of had enough of this. And so I interviewed with a small network visibility startup called Mazu Networks. And Mazu was later acquired by Riverbed. So interestingly, uh, Mazu was very interested in my signal processing background and my master's thesis in pattern recognition, which was kind of cool for me because now I was able to kind of dust that off after about 10 years of not using it. And my first task when I joined Mazu was to help them build an anomaly detection engine for network traffic, which we released in 2008. So just uh, Dwayne did a good job of kind of giving you an overview of Riverbed 
I'm going to go a little bit deeper into that because um, it's kind of important for what we're going to say later. Uh, Riverbed started as a wide area network optimization company uh, selling a product called Steelhead. And Steelhead is uh, a WAN optimizer that reduces network traffic between branch offices. So for example, Staples is one of our customers. They have uh, tons of branch offices and they're sending data all the time. And to help with that, they install these steel heads between the main office and the branch offices and the steel head really reduces the network traffic that they have to send back and forth. Um, Riverbed got a little more interested in network visibility. So they acquired uh, Mazu in 2009, of which I was a part. And Mazu has a product called Profiler, um, which does uh, network visibility. And a few years later, uh, Riverbed acquired uh, OpNet, which has a visibility product called AppResponse. Both of these tools are on-premise, which means that they're physically in your network, um, looking at the packets go by in your, in your network and capturing that telemetry in real time. The two products differ slightly in the view they give you of that telemetry. AppResponse gives you a view of the packets in your network, whereas Profiler gives you a more conversational flow-based approach. And I will explain flows in just a minute. Both of these products offer customizable dashboards so you can look at your current network performance, but they also record, record the full fidelity network telemetry for later querying. So what that means is um, you can then go back and then ask questions about how your network behaved in, in the past. And that is a real differentiator for our customers because being able to answer questions like who is talking to whom and how much uh, days later is essential when you try to discover um, what laptops got infected when George got a virus on his laptop. So, you know, George tells you three days later that he got a virus, you have to go back and figure out what other computers and resources on your network uh, George's laptop, laptop exchanged data with so you can figure out what to cleanse. So both of these products also provide a configurable rule engine that helps you monitor specific pieces of your network and alert the customer if any of these rules are violated. So enterprise networks are big. They have thousands of routers um, with hundreds of thousands of interfaces, connecting millions of hosts and supporting data rates of up to 100 gigabits per second. It is extremely challenging. In fact, I'm gonna go so far as to say impossible to actually capture all the data for large networks because we need to, as I said before, we need to record it for later. Uh, AppResponse, which is our packet viewing solution, can handle a maximum of 20 gigabits per second, which by the way, is insane. The, the accomplishments that that team has made in order to even get 20 gigabits per second is, is amazing. But that is a small fraction of the bandwidth that you typically see on, a, on an enterprise network. So if you need to be able to capture more, what do you do? Well, the first thing you can do is track conversations instead of packets. So think of a conversation or flow as something like your phone bill. It shows you who you talk to and for how long, but it doesn't show you the content of the conversation. That would be packets. Packets are the content. The conversation is the flow. And instead of tallying uh, by month, like the phone company does, we on Profiler tally flows by the minute, leading to a huge reduction in the data that must be stored. And each flow that we record is basically identified by what we call its five tuple, which is the source and destination IP, the source and destination port, and the protocol. And here I'm gonna give you a, kind of a small example of what I mean. So let's say you have a client and uh, that client is trying to go to a Google server to find out some piece of information. So that first arrow is a request to the server for that bit of information. The server then comes back to the client with the requested data. The client thinks about that for a little bit and then makes another request to the server. And then the server, of course, replies with another bit of information to the client. So what this ends up looking like in flow form is that we have three flows from the client to the server, 
and then two flows from the server back to the client. And if all these flows happen within the same minute, then we basically compress them all into one flow from client to server and one flow from server to client. And the one flow from client to server will actually have the metrics that we aggregate for the three flows separately from client to server into one aggregated per minute flow from client to server and likewise from server to client. Because we're limited with what we have on premise, our computing power is very precious and especially our disk IO. In fact, uh, our flow processing and querying is mostly IO bound. Uh, we evaluated several database offerings, both transitional transactional and the newer analytical databases, but they all fell short of the requirements our customers needed. Remember, we don't have unlimited hardware on premise. We can't just spin up new database servers in order to handle increased, increased load. In fact, only by using custom C++ code could we actually get close to the performance we needed. And even so, uh, we have needed to make two major changes to our C++ architecture to keep up with customer demands. The first was a very heavy investment in multi-threading and pipelining, which allowed us to distribute the, the uh, flow better in our CPU cores to take care or take advantage of parallelization. And then the other thing we did was we switched from a row order flow record format, which would be more of a, an intuitive way of storing things, basically where the flows are stored sequentially on the disk in the order that they arrived. Uh, with each metric of that flow as a column. And I kind of show that in the first table there where you have um, 192, 168.1.1 talking to 172, 217, 12.142 over those various ports at a certain timestamp. And then you have the, the 120 metrics that we capture kind of listed as columns there. So that's the one way to do it, the row, the row order way. The other way to do it shown in the second table down there is a more column ordered format in which each column has the flow ID, the five tuple, and the metric, and the rows of that column are the actual metric values. And in this way, the flow ID is not repeated in millions of rows, which is great, that's a big savings. And you're also reading the handful of metrics that you want rather than all 120, and then basically throwing out the 118 or so that you don't really care about. Uh, lastly, you can also sort the columns to keep similar data localized in storage, and then that allows for efficient compression of the data. And so we compress the data because it really helps us alleviate our disk I.O. problem um, because we've the disk I.O. is more precious to us than compute power. So we're basically trading uh, compute power uh, for disk IO, meaning we're trading more computes for fewer disk IO operations. So with all these optimizations, we essentially got an improvement of about three to four X on data ingestion and about two to 10 X on query performance, depending on the type of query. The payoff of all this is that profiler um, storing flows instead of packets and with all these optimizations, Profiler can now process up to 2 million raw flows per second, or about 150 billion, and that's billion with a B, raw flows per day. And because the average flow record on disk is about 750 bytes, that means Profiler is storing about 375 megabytes per second, or about 32 terabytes of data per day. We don't have the luxury right now of spinning up more servers on demand because we're on premise. So we current, we're currently limited to a maximum cluster size of 20 nodes. And of course, adding more nodes doesn't always solve the problem. More nodes will help you distribute the flow recording task, but it makes the, the query more costly because then you have to collate the data across multiple nodes and then aggregate it all together. And because networks are getting larger and transmitting more data, the customer always wants more, those darn customers. So to help with that, we're actually actively investigating a Lambda-like architecture in which the flow data is stored once in our column ordered flow store, which I've talked about uh, in the previous slides, to be used for our complicated long haul queries that need a complete picture of the data, 
and then stored again, basically duplicate storage in an analytical database engine indexed by high level network objects, such as interfaces, devices, protocols, ports, and applications, which will be used for quick access to important network resources. The analytical database will also pre-compute answers to commonly asked questions like, what are the utilizations of my core interfaces for the last hour? Or for an example more familiar, when you look up London in Google, you get answers to a set of commonly asked questions like, what is the population of London? Or what is the current weather? How many square miles is London? Things of that nature. So up to this point in the talk, I've spent time mostly talking about um, the challenges that we faced in being able to record network telemetry at enterprise scale. And we've, we've done some really good stuff there, but it's really only half of the problem. It might not even be half, actually. Um, so back in 2000, I went to a software conference back when you could actually go to software confer conferences. And I heard a story that I thought, thought was interesting. It could be apocryphal, I'm not sure, but I, I still like the story and I think it's useful. Um, a guy there said that back in the 1950s, Bell Labs was looking at the growth rate of telephone networks in the United States. And back then in the 1950s, to place a telephone call, you had to have someone in a physical switchboard uh, that would physically connect your call to your, your destination, right? So they were looking at the growth of telephone networks and they realized that at current growth rates, by the 1970s, every man, woman, and child in the United States would end up having to be a switchboard operator. Obviously, this sounds a little ridiculous, right? That, that did not happen. However, it really was solved in that every man, woman, and child did become a switchboard operator because with the advent of switching networks, people were able to dial their own numbers and then the switch, switching networks were able to handle that, the switching automatically. So in much the same way, I feel like our computer networks are similar, growing in complexity every year and outstripping a human's ability to manage them. Profiler is a great tool for managing your network and it's kind of like an encyclopedia, which works as long as you know exactly how to phrase your question or exactly, you know, in the switchboard analogy, if you know exactly what circuit to connect. What we need now is more like Google for your network that helps you ask the right questions, especially if you don't know how to exactly frame your question. So someone comes to you and says that there's a problem somewhere on your network and you using your experience as a human know to ask Profiler what questions. Profiler gives you the answer, then you know how to go mitigate that, that problem. Unfortunately, because networks are growing, that's no longer going to be, we're not going to be able to do that. Otherwise, every one of us is going to end up having to be an IT engineer. So on Profiler and AppResponse, we've tried to, to help with this by uh, adding automation. And the first form comes in the form of automated alerts. In this case, the machine automatically monitors a customer configured rule and generates alerts if a rule is violated. So that's great because now instead of having a human stare at a dashboard all day looking for something to go wrong, the machine actually tells you when something is wrong. However, the person had to actually set up the rules and know what thresholds to monitor. So for example, in the graph that I've shown below, the rule is tell me if when any server is seeing more than 225 megabits per second. Okay, fantastic, the machine will tell you. However, the person had to know what servers to monitor and also had to know that 225 megabits per second was the, the critical value. And also the person then has to know how to go fix the problem when that problem pops up. A better solution is then to incorporate machine learning into the automated monitoring so we could alert when the monitored network traffic was unusual. Now we free the person from having to know what the threshold was because the machine figures it out. We introduced this at two, on two, in 2008 on Profiler when we introduced the Holt Winter seasonal algorithm to learn normal network behavior, to make predictions based on what normal was supposed to be, 
compare the actual measurement to the prediction and generate an alert if appropriate. It was used so much that after a year, uh, or a year after introduction, we had to dramatically increase the scale of the monitoring from only 10,000 supported objects um, back when we introduced it to 100,000 monitored objects. And I've included here a graph of what that looks like. And you can see um, the blue is the actual signal. The gray is what the algorithm was predicting. The green is what's considered the normal band. And when the signal goes outside of the normal band, we, we generate an alert. So that's fantastic, right? But we still haven't solved this problem. Now, we, the user doesn't have to say what the threshold is, but they still have to recognize what the critical pieces of the network are to monitor. And they still have to figure out what went wrong when we say that something is anomalous. Lastly, that brings us to what we're working on now, which is have the appliance monitor everything without being explicitly told to, and to do so with much greater accuracy than ever before. And the accuracy is really critical here because if we are monitoring everything in the network, even small errors in anomaly detection can potentially bury customers under an avalanche of false positives. And we really want to avoid that because if we don't, the, user, the customers aren't going to uh, listen to us anymore and the product is going to be useless. So we're evaluating, evaluating a wide range of time series modeling techniques from traditional statistical techniques to well-known seasonal decomposition like Holt Winters to very new techniques, including neural networks with the idea in mind that no one technique might work for every monitoring task. We can ship the product with a set of algorithms and have the machine learn over time which ones work best for a given customer's deployment. And so that would give us now the machines monitor. You don't have to tell the, the appliance what to monitor. It's monitoring everything. It's figuring out what's normal and what's not. And it's giving you alerts when things go wrong. However, that's we're three quarters of the way there, but the last quarter is the toughest. The ultimate goal, of course, then is root cause analysis the holy grail of network monitoring, if you will, which means that instead of simply tell you, telling you something is wrong, the appliance tells you what is wrong and suggestions on how to fix it. So for example, your latency is high for a critical application. Well, we, the appliance, noticed that your DSCP markings seen by a router commonly used by this traffic for this application changed recently, which is likely the cause of the latency issue. Getting to this goal is going to be extremely challenging. There is some promising research in this area, but it will likely be several years before we can productize even a first version of it. We'll keep at it, and hopefully, the next time I talk to you, we will have, we will have an answer for it. That's all I had. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Brian, for sharing that tech technology that Riverbed has been bringing to customers. We'd welcome questions in the chat if you'd like to talk more with Brian and Dwayne. And I think we're going to stop screen share, Brian, and run a poll as well. OK, if I can figure out how to pull that back up, I will. So I'll say we, we had a reaction from Kevin of 20 gigabits a second. Can you tell a little bit more about the, that speed that you're able to achieve and why that matters for your customers? Well, so the, the problem there is um, the customers want to be able to see everything in the network, right? And unfortunately, um, enterprise level links are at 100 gigabits per second. So obviously 20 gigabits is less than 100 gigabits. Um, so that means theoretically that you would need uh, five different app responses to be able to capture all the packets at, at speed and scale for even a single link. And enterprise networks are typically comprised of many of those links. Um, so the, the data management problem becomes extremely difficult from a packet point of view at that scale. You just can't you can't scale up enough boxes or you have to be uh, buying truckloads of, of terabyte disks from Amazon every day in order to, uh, to keep up with it. Um, so 
the customers want all that because they want to they want to have full fidelity. They want to know what's going on in their network. So the packet capturing packets works very well for kind of smaller to medium networks. But once you get past a certain size, you almost have to go uh, for the flow based solution profiler or you have to pick and choose what you want to view with packet level stuff. So we've seen customers basically um, use app response for very critical servers so that they can have full fidelity on that very critical server, which is less than 20 gigabits per second, and then use kind of profiler to monitor the overall network as a whole. So our next speakers are going to be from life sciences for a little while. Can you talk to us about, I know that's a portion of your customers, how you're working with different companies that might be more in the healthcare domain. I imagine they're pretty, you're pretty neutral across industries. You shared some examples in your remarks. Uh, sure. I mean, so a lot of our customers are big banks. Um, we do have a bunch of hospitals that are our customers. Um, I don't have personal knowledge of how life science companies are using our products. I mean, I'm assuming they're basically using them for network type operations and not, you know, decoding the human genome or anything like that, or protein folding or anything of that nature. So um, I wish I had a better example to give you, but, you know, I you normally I hear about customer stuff when something goes wrong, like, you know, we were trying to do this and the, 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 the box fell over. And so, you know, what can we do to fix this? Um, but I know we do have some life science customers. Um, I'm not sure how large their networks are. Typically our biggest customers are the big Wall Street financials, um, which have huge, huge networks that they're trying to monitor. Thanks. I'm going to turn it over to Dwayne for a minute and have Dwayne tell us a little bit more about the riverbed site in the research park, the types of work you do in software engineering, and maybe a quick commercial of how you're trying to grow your team, what roles you might have. Right. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Laura. Uh, yeah, so uh, we've been on, on the research park, as you mentioned, for quite a, quite a, quite a while. Uh, we've mostly... Uh, in We've got uh, software development uh, teams uh, there uh, focused on us and specifically on our flagship product, Steelhead, um, although we are expanding. Uh, uh, at, uh, the other one of the other areas that we do a lot of is around software QA, uh, software testing. Uh, so um, there's the uh, the bridge between the two. We do more of a solutions oriented testing so that uh, we look at an enterprise network, try to model what's happening on these large enterprise networks, and then uh, develop our test scenarios around that. So then, yes, as you mentioned, uh, good plug. Uh, recently, we are looking internship program, and also we do also have uh, some open positions uh, here in Champaign. We've got three positions, two of those on that development team that we have. Uh, one on applications and protocols, one more on drivers, uh, as well as one of those on the solutions QA team as well. So uh, a lot of opportunities there, if that was of interest uh, to, to go check it out, uh, link me up on LinkedIn and I'll definitely have a chat. Great, thanks Dwayne and Brian.